Well, can we uh, continue on with the show, or did you have more bathroom? I get no. I just updates, I just wanted talk. to let everybody know that if I'm not as normally as entertaining today as I normally am, it's just because I'm I'm a little I'm feeling puny. I'm under the weather. If you're unhappy because you took a puny Russo this morning, I'm pretty sure you had plenty of Russo last night to fill you up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll get there you soon. Know, we'll get there soon. Good transition. Good transition. No, let's just, let's go into that now. Maybe this. <laughs> and we can talk about other more somber things later on, but maybe this will somehow instigate me to just sh all over the place. I'll do it verbally, even if I'm not physically doing it. Yeah, it, can, the can, darks. Go ahead. Well, let me introduce this. This is the Dark Side of the Ring episode on Bash at the Beach 2000, I believe, with Hulk Hogan versus Jeff Jarrett, Vince Russo, and Eric Bischoff. Big parts of the behind the scenes going ons, and of course, Dave Meltzer, a big part of this episode. This episode may have been the epitome of the things that are wrong with the series right now, and also the most entertaining show in the history <laughs> of television. <laughs> I took lots of notes. I'm telling you. Uh, it, it, I think that two, two controversies or two facts have been settled here today or by this program. Eric Bischoff doesn't know nearly as much about wrestling as he has convinced many people that he does. And now you know why everybody, everybody hates Vince Russo if they have to spend more than 10 minutes in a room with him. And I will use his his name that he was given by his poor, unsuspecting parents through this program, because if you just threw around the nickname Shitstain, it would be so confusing as to who to apply it to in this episode. And especially at the root of this, it was a heel program between two guys, both with their own versions of delusions of grandeur. And... You're talking about the episode, not even the whole Russo, Hogan, Jarrett thing. You're talking about Bischoff and Russo. Yes, at the heart of it, that's what, you know, both people are somehow pleased to take credit for the absolute shittiest idea that was ever foisted off in wrestling. And they both believe that if it had come off exactly as they intended it, which was basically the way it came off, as everybody tells a story, that it would have been brilliant. They neither one of them have figured out that everything they did was the shits and everything they wanted to do that didn't get done was equally the shits. And it took both poor Lance Storm, who was just a locker room bystander in this and Jeff Jarrett, the only one with any amount of, Hey, none of this was my fault. So I can speak freely that was involved in it. It sounded like they were rational individuals. Uh, but again, you, from the start of this thing, you can tell that Russo legitimately he has lived in this idea that he did great genius things for so long that now he's convinced himself and i guarantee you he could pass a lie detector test that he was the greatest thing that ever lived and ever happened in wrestling and that if only he had been able to do things completely unfettered my god the last 25 years, the business would have been 10 times bigger than it is now, like it was right before he got in it to begin with, when it was 10 times bigger than it is now. I mean, but am I overstating this in any way that these two came off, at both of them, Bischoff, a well-educated, very verbose, more cultured version but they both came off as delusional fucking lunatics, did they not? I thought Russo came off worse than Bischoff. Well, yeah, I mean, you almost have to. Even from, like, the very beginning, it was like, I hate pro wrestling, I hate yeah. what it does to people, what it does to me, it makes you into this. It doesn't have to be like that. Oh, wait, wait, 
Wait a minute. He said, I, I, I wrote down some quotes. I despise the wrestling business and the people in it. You can't be a good person and exist in the wrestling business. Is that why he wasn't a good person in the wrestling business? <laughs> That's why we were all trying to get him out of it. We told you, Vince, you won't like it. No. I mean, with Bischoff, we know from other things that he has either uh, issues with memory, and this is a long time ago, and he's not a young guy, and he's not, you know, uh, he's not an archivist like you he's, or someone. He's not a truth teller, is what you were looking around well, trying to say. It's either he's forgetful or he just says things that aren't true. But at least he comes across, you know, very smooth while doing it so that you almost believe he has to know what he's talking about, unless you know the facts. And Russo is just this constant attempt to convince you of what he is saying. I have to be honest with you. I have to tell you. I have to be honest with you. Just be <laughs> honest. You don't have to constantly tell me you're being honest. Does that mean that, you're well, lying that, all that, the other times? Yeah, and that's also, that's what he does while he's thinking of something to say. Uh, you can tell, first of all, you can tell people who have never really been in the wrestling business because they use the word scripts. And he was doing that when he first, it, 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 that was where we first knew that he was a fucking completely clueless mark. I never heard the word scripts in a locker room until the late 90s. I, maybe with some idiot from Turner Broadcasting's business department during the WCW days, but otherwise, late 90s, WWF. It was actually something people always shot down. Do you guys have scripts? No, we don't no, have scripts. No, fuck you. That, those were fighting words. That was a fighting word. The fucking script. I'll punch you in the fucking teeth. Is that in and the script? Then, yeah. And then he said, I was in the wrestling business since 1991. That in his awkward verbiage and poor grammar, because he so that makes thirty over thirty years. Does he think his fan radio show that he paid to have on a local radio station was in the wrestling business? Well, if we're going back to ninety one, he had a video store which had wrestling videos in it, and then he partnered with John Arezzi for a brief period of time. Yeah, and they had a very big breakup. And then he started trying to get in with WWE. He launched his radio show to help him try to get in with WWE. And then after that went under in like early 93, he somehow found his way into the magazine. He, because he kept beating on Linda McMahon's office door. And I don't even know if email existed then. If it did, he was writing them and sitting in her outer office and pitching ideas. Just then, then he did the same thing with Vince. And then, he managed to convince the Turner Broadcasting people from afar that he knew what he was doing, and he got a job there that he, as this program delineates, failed spectacularly at. And then he convinced poor old Nashville Dixie that he knew what the fuck he was doing and leached off of her to uh, great failure for all those years. The company was worse off when he left it than when he got there. And they were farther in debt, I'll tell you that. And then since then, he has continued to beg people for a job by campaigning about how much better he used to do it and they ought to let him do it again. And every time anybody's let him do it, it's been the shits. So anyway. And also he says he hates the business and everyone in it. Why should he, he get any more chances? Everyone in it, except when he's begging them publicly, give me a job. Or I'm trying to tell Vince he should bring me back. Or I would offer my help to Tony, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I won't belabor it, but somebody go back and find the YouTube clip where you and I sat down and did some figuring and figured out that I have never in the history of my life asked for any job I've ever had in wrestling. They have all been offered to me. You know, the other so, thing is, I just want to say, Jeff Jarrett came across really good in this. Like, this is the best of Jeff Jarrett, sitting there, reasonably and rationally trying to explain something, not being hyperbolic. The other thing with Russo that's unbearable, the more you watch him, everything, he adds syllables to everything. <laughs> wrestling! Everything! Wrestling! Everything! He talks like that! You have to listen to that! 
as he's droning on and on, coming up with ideas for people that he's never heard of before until three days ago or whatever. Anyway. And by the way, they had so many clips of, because I wasn't watching WCW in 1999 and 2000. I was had just started the OVW program down here, and that's the last thing I was going to watch was WCW. So I never saw so much of Vince Russo on television. And I knew he did stupid things. I knew he put the belt on himself. I knew he got speared by Goldberg and bashed his brains and gave himself further brain damage than what Mother Nature perpetrated. But I didn't. He was out there constantly, apparently. And here's the thing. Again, he was acting like that these were brilliant things he was doing when he said, well, every promo that I cut, what? what? On every television show that you wrote yourself into, Vince Russo has never appeared on a television program that he didn't write himself into. And Brian, I ask you, going back to when it happened, you were old enough then, did you ever hear anybody say, what a great performance by Vince Russo? What a great promo Russo cut. Wow, did you see that great angle? that Russo was in ever by anybody. No, I mean, of course not. But yet I do remember one of his quotes was not in this episode. It was in an interview where he was, this was years ago. And he was trying to defend not only the way he used celebrities, but just any non wrestling people inside or in the periphery of the blah, blah, blah. And this was a quote that I've committed this to memory. This was where this fucking guy's head was at. Well, if I can learn to work in the ring, anyone can. He convinced himself he learned how to work because he, he wrote himself into a show to either take bumps or more often give people bumps or carry a baseball bat around like he was goddamn Buford Pusser wearing his Howard Stern want to be fucking New York badass outfit. It's embarrassing. Howard he never, should be Howard ashamed. Never dressed, Howard Stern never dressed like that. <clears throat> no, but Russo thinks he did because that's who he wanted to be. Except if Howard Stern went around hitting people with a baseball bat. They, the TBS executives down there hired who they had been led to believe was responsible for Vince McMahon's success, and he came in and shit all over the company and thought that he was making himself a star. And he was embarrassing the television program. Even Uncle Dave admitted he did long-term harm to the wrestling business. So then... Eric, let's get back to him for a second. Let's get let's go to Eric. What? I was just gonna say the funny thing about this was it was like Russo hates Bischoff. Bischoff hates Russo. Yes. They both hate Meltzer. Meltzer's putting them both down. It's the funniest thing. Well, that's why I'm saying let's let's come back to Russo. Let's go to Bischoff. Eric Bischoff, here's a quote. I studied what made WWF successful and decided to do the opposite. Well, he did. They went out of business. And then he said, I was the first one to create live weekly TV. He didn't say except for every territory in wrestling pre-1984. And then he said, bringing in Hulk Hogan in 1994 in WCW was a seismic shift. Hogan bombed as a babyface for almost two years before they did the NWO thing. It was Hall and Nash that kicked it off. We've covered that. And Hogan was riding around Universal Studios in a fucking rented goddamn convertible with Jimmy Hart on a megaphone trying to get people to come to the fucking tapings. That was Disney, not Universal. Disney, you know, I'm sorry. Universal was Russo's other fucking project he talked himself into for the next company he killed so then <laughs> then Russo is telling the 
audience here on Dark Side uh, how he told Vince McMahon the way that it was going to be. I told Vince. And I've heard that same pitch, but it was groveling and whining to Vince. It wasn't, I'm, it wasn't laying the law down to Vince McMahon. It was, but Vince, that's too wrestling. People don't want the wrestling. And Crash TV, he described as short match, backstage fight, vignette, short match, fight in locker room, vignette. What does that sound like? I don't huh? know. I don't know what. That sounds like the same thing we see on Wednesday nights because of fucking Mark from the goddamn 90s is booking a television show today. His influence lives on. And it's a shits today like it was then because we've all seen it. And it's nothing different. And it doesn't take any talent to just do that. Let's just let everybody fight. It's been tried since with everybody. Even the WWE still does some of that shit because they've got in their patterns, but they're drawing huge ratings for the time these days. But everything that he did has been copied and done, not only by himself in TNA, but by all the other marks for that time in wrestling that had gotten a business and become either wrestlers or promoters. And it's never fucking worked. Because you don't have Austin and Rock and Taker and Foley. And you don't have the standing of the top company and an unlimited budget. Well, Tony does not the standing, but the unlimited budget. But this shit has never worked without stars and a guy like Vince McMahon controlling it and running the fucking business. Without one guy clearly in charge, you got what you got here was a bunch of clueless executives, half of them that didn't want wrestling in TBS or on TBS, hiring a bunch of people that were good salesmen of themselves and all fought with each other, Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, Vince Russo, because they all were just out for themselves and how to get the fucking biggest buck out of the billionaire. Sounds familiar. We're flashing back 25 years later today. But it, it, that's what, again, that's what you got from Russo. Ideas. Everybody says that. Yeah, he got plenty, even the people that try to be nice to him. Yeah, oh, he had plenty of ideas. Or nice about him, not knock him. Yeah, he had a lot of ideas. He had, yeah, fight in the bathroom. I had that idea in third grade. So... Then Dave says that WCW in 1999 was headed to the iceberg and TBS sends Bischoff home in 99 because he's got too big for his britches. What was, what was the reason they sent him home? I can't even remember that time. I Did can't you? even remember. I was By that point, before Russo even got there, I stopped watching WCW every week. But I mean, they've written books about this, so it yeah. was some goddamn, you know, hey, Rube, that he got into with the executives. and. At the same time, here comes this other knucklehead that can sell him a bill of goods. They've sent Eric home. So here's the fucking guy that they have been led to believe is responsible for the WWF success, Vince Russo, who tried to get... Apparently now his story is, I know when they added SmackDown, he went in and tried to get a big raise, which Vince didn't pay you by the fucking show. He paid you by the job. You wrote one show or 20 shows. You didn't really write any shows most of the time because he was fucking taking your papers and doing it the way he wanted anyway. So Vince wants a raise, and now apparently he wanted to move out of town closer to his wife's family, which is apparently in and around the Evansville, Indiana environs. Yeah, the raise is one thing. I could see the argument yeah. for that if you're him, but not, I want to raise and also, I'm moving to Indiana. Yeah, fuck you. He was mad me and Bruce were all the way up in Monroe. Right? Like, Goddamn, pal, you need to be closer to the office. We can't afford it. And so this, <laughs> this idiot wants to move to Indiana. Vince says, hire a nanny. And considering his kids were little ragamuffins, maybe he should have. They'd have been brought up better. But anyway... So that's when Vince stabbed Vince Russo stabs Vince McMahon in the back and makes the under the table behind the scenes deal to go to 
WCW, which after about six to nine months, I'm betting Vince McMahon was like, oh, thank God he did that. It was I, I, probably Vince McMahon was kicking himself because he didn't have the idea to send Russo down there. But a lot of people, I mean, I don't know if people still talk about this. Back in the day, they thought that because of the results and how bad the TV was, that it may have been an intentional thing that Vince McMahon sent yes. him there <laughs> to kill the company, right? You've yes. heard that. Yes. And there is precedent in wrestling. Remember Bill Watts paid Grizzly Smith to keep booking for Jack Curtis and, and uh, George Culkin when he was booking for the opposition in Mississippi because he was running him out of business, doing his best. but. At the time, yes, they thought that, but in a, no, because obviously I knew I was had just come to Louisville, but obviously was talking to people in the office every day, and I got the scoop immediately. Hey, did you hear what Vince did? He fucking called Vince McMahon. We, we, he made the deal when Vince McMahon was in England and didn't know what the fuck was going on, and then Vince McMahon flies back to the Raw show at the Meadowlands about 45 minutes away from Russo's house, and Russo called him on the phone and told him he wasn't coming. Didn't even have the goddamn nerve, the guts, the balls, or anything to come down and look him in the eye and say, well, I'm soaking Atlanta for a bunch of money, but thank you for the opportunity, Vince. So anyway, so now, and by the way, have you noticed Dave's nose is looking like W.C. Fields in his final days. <laughs> I'm sorry, but he Stop could be <laughs> just moments away from a Christmas Day fucking occurrence. Anyway. Oh, come on. Come um, on. So Russo claims the ratings went up. <laughs> the statistics say otherwise, and that's been proven. And then TBS sent Russo home after three months. What was the first thing they sent him home for? God, I can't remember because it was musical chairs at that point. Because they had no control over these wild fucking ragamuffins and hooligans that they had hired to run this company. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because remember, when he got there, you didn't actually see him. You just started hearing his voice. People would walk into a room and yes. the camera would be where he was. And they'd be having a meeting with what was supposed to be the powers that be. But everyone would get confused and call him the powers to be. Which doesn't make too much sense. Or to be or not to be. And see, again, this this all came from his his video store, because since it failed and went out of business, he had plenty of time when he had no customers to sit there and watch all these rotten independent art films and steal scenes out of them. So Turner Broadcasting then apparently thought that Bischoff could oversee Russo like Vince McMahon did, because that's one of the things that they were then hearing was, well, Vince McMahon was the filter for this fucking giant open sewer of ideas and of course then jeff jarrett he realized eric bischoff and vince russo together were never going to work because neither one of them russo's opinion of wrestling is complete shit anybody can do it and it takes a genius writer to make anything good bischoff's opinion of wrestling was i'm a genius and i did I'm, it <laughs> i'm a genius and i invented it and the truth of course lies down the block and around the corner. Lance Storm mentioned, and this is true, Russo wanted to make him Bischoff's illegitimate son. And he pointed out, he's like 10 years older than I am. And Bischoff's quote in his, uh, again, his, the, his way with prose, it became apparent to me Vince Russo was void of any creative instincts. So then... Together, they come up with the Millionaire's Club versus the Young Blood, which remember, well, I'm sure you weren't watching, but Russo tried to redo in TNA with the main event mafia. When it was Sting and Angle and Nash and every big name, like five or six of them in a group, and then the, the young guys that were supposed to break through and become stars because of that, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, and uh, they, they certainly did. They broke through and became stars in other fucking companies. Did, did, tell me what you hated about the Millionaire's Club versus the Young Blood as a concept, and then I will explain to everyone in detail why it's the shits.
I didn't watch too much of it in real time. Again, WCW drove me off in early to mid-99, and I wasn't really interested. And then I tried to check it out again when Russo came in, but it became, whatever WCW was, and it wasn't very good at that point, it became an off-brand version of WWE's Attitude yeah. Era TV, which you know, we now know a lot of it was the Russo style. With Vince McMahon as an editor, this was without that. So it was really, really bad TV. And the new blood, I mean, it didn't really work out for anyone, did it? The young blood. The young Not blood. new blood, just young blood. Well, and that's the whole point. And it, it, with, as with anything, in there, there was a germ of a concept. And the idea was Russo was always trying to push because he would only listen to the smart fans because the smart fans were the ones who knew he existed. And then later when he was, because he was never going to be on television as anything other than like the magazine editor. He made a few shows in WWF or he did commentary for a little while on WWF New York. Jesus Christ. But the smart fans were the only ones he listened to. He didn't consider the audience as a whole, which again... Even though more were smart, a lot of people were smart, but didn't live their goddamn life about this stuff. And so they didn't know every twist and turn and insider reference. So Russo would get the idea that all the fans were in a backlash against all the stars, all the accepted stars, the big stars, the big names. And these young guys who are ready because the old guys won't put them over in fake matches. That's why that these young guys are pissed off. I mean, he came out and basically told people that. And then he would have the young guys fight the established guys. But the problem with that was you had on one side, a group of the biggest names in fucking wrestling. And on the other side, a group of, not big fucking names. And so it didn't work. You don't get people over in groups, in mass, in goddamn clumps. The way you do it is by involving younger guys, talented guys that the people are starting to take to with the established guys, either as partners or against them, where you can see this young guy on his own, not in another group of young guys, hanging with the, the people that you truly know and believe are main event stars. And whether it's a tag team partner, whether they break up or not, you've elevated that guy to a main event spot. Or if it's a an opponent, the star opponent, and, and then he eventually gets a win, elevates the younger guy. And as as well, you don't, just because the, maybe the WCW fans, they were in a backlash in some element then, even still because of the WWF X names that had taken over. In the South, they got a lot of fucking feedback that we don't want the fucking WWF guys. We want Ric Flair. We want Sting. So you didn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, we're not going to use any of the legends or we're going to beat all the legends. You use guys that the audience still wanted and still appreciated as legends like Flair, who Bischoff didn't fucking like. But to people, they were not hooting even in 1999 or 2000 to get rid of Ric Flair. They were saying that most of the creative he was involved in was fucking rotten. But the fans were not clamoring fuck Ric Flair so Ric Flair could have made a younger guy with either a job or an association with this guy. But Russo wants to do this gang warfare bullshit. And that meant that the names stayed names and the young guys never had a chance. What do you think about that logic? It makes perfect sense. And again, I didn't care. But, you know, the other thing is Jeff Jarrett was really good in this special, but it did need to be pointed out he was Russo's best friend. And he's the one who really propped up Russo more than anyone coming out of this. 
So it does need to be pointed out that he's been like Russo's guy. They, yeah. made, they made it sound like he was just, it just happened to be him in this situation. Well, I can say sometimes you consider people your best friend for a period of time and then they turn out to be complete weasels. And since Jeff has figured that out now, you know, you can't hold it against him for saying that, not wanting to say in 2023, yeah, I was a friend of this fucking guy's. He didn't want to get any on him now. But did you like when Russo said, well, Bischoff wanted to be in charge, so I called Brad Siegel at TBS and told him to put Eric Bischoff in charge. Like, he's telling, he's always telling everybody what to do. So, again, the idea was Jeff Jarrett was the WCW champion, and, and he says he was to face multiple of the legends and beat them and then drop the belt to Booker T. And I believe that was the plan. Pretty much throughout this whole thing, you can believe that's what they were intending to do, or most of them. And he was to get the last win over Hogan. And that's where, again, Russo keeps saying, I wrote Hogan very strong, but he wouldn't win. How did he write him strong? He didn't have shit to do with the way matches were put together. He could put bullet points down, like Scott Steiner runs in with a fucking tank. But I can tell you from experience, even in TNA, the guys when putting matches together always threw the majority of his fucking suggestions for matches out. He could come up with the fucking formats and the finishes, but the matches were up to the boys, and that's the problem is Hogan was in this too. A noted truth teller if ever there was one so he's the only person not obviously in the documentary not speaking to the filmmakers here so everyone else has their side represented but hogan although well, i guess you could say bischoff in a sense represents he hogan. was uh his side was partially represented when they had tape of him on bubba the love sponge but they couldn't say bubba the love sponge's name i guess so they just said a tampa radio show but that, that's the thing. The bone of contention was Hulk Hogan had creative control. Russo wanted Jarrett to beat Hogan and then drop the thing to Booker T. Bischoff being Hogan's buddy and knowing that they would do business together after this fucking Turner Broadcasting thing immolated or combusted or whatever it did. Um, He was on Hulk's side. And plus... <laughs> What the fuck? Why would anybody agree with Russo? So Russo says he keeps rewriting the script to have Hogan wipe out more people. And Bischoff's story is Russo didn't get to vote. This is a quote. He didn't get to vote. He thought he did, but he didn't. So everybody's story comes to shit here because... The night of the show, Bischoff and Hogan tell Russo that Hogan's winning. He's using his creative control, and they want Jeff Jarrett to throw the match. And then Hogan will storm out mad, and then WCW will realize that Hogan wasn't coming back. So WCW would vacate the title and have a tournament for the new world champion and the last two guys in the tournament would face each other at Halloween Havoc where Hulk Hogan would reappear and say, uh-uh, I still have the belt, and if you want this, you've got to beat me. This is the idea <laughs> that Eric Bischoff is giving you with a straight face that that's what they wanted to do on purpose. He's acting like this was going to be a great fucking idea. <clears throat> It was the blind leading the blind. And, and, Ho then, and Hogan knew how to take advantage of the whole thing. Yeah, and then because, yeah, Hogan's going to beat everybody and not have to work. He'll get six months off and beat everybody. And then Russo flips his shit because I rewrote this show twice. Oh, poor baby. And Bischoff calls Brad Siegel, the president of TBS, and he said, go with Bischoff's idea, which, <laughs> Jesus. That's why TBS couldn't run a wrestling company and why Vince won the war. Because they would back up an idea like that because it was Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. So then Vin Russo gets mad and he's determined to do something else. 
And again, he's in 1995, he was running a failing video store, and five years later, he's given Hulk Hogan ultimatums. The reason why that he couldn't get anything done is because nobody took him fucking seriously. Because once you sat in a fucking room with this fucking guy for 10 minutes, if you were in the wrestling business, you knew that he was as full of shit as Aunt Lola's Christmas turkeys. And nobody was taking him seriously. Bischoff, in 1993, had been a C-string announcer. But they gave him the job first, and he got Hogan's ear. And of anybody, of anybody in the whole fucking equation, you would listen to Hulk Hogan, the biggest wrestling star on the planet at one time, except for the fact that he's only going to do whatever benefits him. And he's going to work the people who are on his side into thinking that it helps them too. So this is the ultimate heel program. So, Russo pitches it to Jeff Jarrett. Bro, this is what we're doing. And they're trying to work the boys. Not even the... the, the the fans are just going to be fucking puzzled, but they're trying to work the boys, so he tells Jeff Jarrett that Hogan won't do the job and just lay down. Just lay down in the middle of the ring for him. Is it ever a good idea to work the locker room? No. Well, all right. Digression here for a second. To work the overall locker room sometimes so that they don't spill the goddamn beans with their running their dick lickers on social media or Twitter or Facebook or whatever the fuck about not telling them things that they don't need to know. Yes, you should do that. It used to, the locker room could know things weeks in advance and the fans would never know a thing. And now it's instantaneous. So I think the locker room should not ever be told shit anymore that they don't absolutely need to know. But I don't think you should lie to the locker room about an angle that you're doing on your fucking show that would get heat if the boys believe it, that they would hate one or more of the top fucking stars in the company. So anyway, in trying to work the boys, he just tells Jeff to lay down, and Jeff is dumbfounded. And he charitably said the story was not well thought out and didn't make any sense. And he explained all the reasons and that everybody loses. And then he was saying, do I really want to be a part of this mess? And my father and my grandmother showed a picture of Teeny with Nick and Roy. He's like, do I, you know, do I jump Hulk Hogan and make him actually beat me? Or, you know... Then he finally just got disgusted enough. Let's just get it over with. It's just... And that's the thing. Again, Russo did not care because he always wanted everybody to know that wrestling was fake so that his ridiculously and unfortunately it, amateurishly inflated ego could take credit for everything. He's like, he's like Stan Lee. Think about this, Brian. Stan Lee and Vince Russo wrote multiple exclamation points, randomly capitalized words, were all about catchphrases, and stole Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko's credit. Vince Russo grew up reading Marvel comics. He, he wrote like Stan Lee. Anyway. You know, I know a lot of people don't like Stan Lee as much as they used to, and like you said, he ripped off... <laughs> Some artists, but I don't think it's fair to put him in the but same. No, league. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But well, see, that's the thing. Vince Russo was a poor imitation of Stan Lee, like he was a poor imitation of everything else he tried to do. He got the superficial, you know, gist of something, but he never understood anything. He just did it for the stupidest people that he could find. And so, and why was Russo at ringside? When Jeff was laying down, because he had put, he had to be in the spotlight, and he had made himself an authority figure there. And people wonder what the fuck happened to WCW. You got this goddamn pop-eyed, buggy whip-armed fucking idiot 
is strutting around with his crooked walk and broing everybody and wearing a goddamn New York t-shirt and telling people what the fuck to do. And people started going, what the fuck is this? And Jeff Jarrett had a great analysis of wrestling has always been about blurring the lines, what's real, what's not, but if you confuse them, you lose them. And that's all that Russo shit was, was confusing. And at least Vince McMahon kept the focus on the main things. Jim Ross could tell you what was going on with Austin Rock and Taker. And the, the television studio could do these packages that zeroed in on the fucking main issues and created the emotion. And he was just spitting things out, throwing slop out of a bucket. So anyway. You know, and again, to him at ringside, you asked about that before. Everything at this point, way too often, was a play on Montreal. Oh, yeah, they were still doing that. A screw job or a ring yeah. bell or the authority figure intervenes. Yeah. He's laying uh, down. Pin him. Come on. This is what yeah. I want. So Russo said that at that all he cared about was the plan working exactly the same way I laid it out. It's all part of the story. So Hogan pins Jeff. Jeff walks out. Bischoff said it went according to plan, like it had been good to that point. He still thinks that part was good. And then here's the thing. Bischoff and Hogan, and they really do, they leave the show and go to the airport, get on the plane, they're celebrating, they're toasting each other. They've been part of the worst, phoniest, rottenest match slash angle in wrestling history. But back at the show, Russo was still at work. And Bischoff, and I believe this was the story at the time, contemporaneously, as they say, that both his and Hogan's phones blew up when they landed and found out what Russo had done. But they said they wanted to make people believe it, so that's why that Hogan and Bischoff left the building before the show was over. What does Bischoff have to do with that? Why would people not believe it if Hogan left? That's fine. Why did Bischoff have to leave? What kind of an executive leaves the show before it's over to begin with? You can just tell people on the air he left and went to the airport or the medical facility or whatever, right? He really left because he didn't give a shit. He wanted to go get on a plane with his buddy Hulk and drink champagne out of a Stewardess is slipper. And by the way, for the record, maybe the most ridiculous reenactments on this episode, whoever they had put oh, yeah. Bischoff in that wig yeah. and Hogan with no arms cheering on the fucking plane <laughs> with the drinks. It's so stupid at this point. Uh, but it, well, they, they had footage of all these idiots doing this shit anyway. They didn't need to reenact it. So Russo went back out after they really left. And again, Bischoff had no reason to leave other than his ego, and he didn't give a shit. But Russo went out and cut a promo again, once again, thinking he's the center of everything. He was important enough to do this and get away with it, not only in terms of coming out and, and exposing the business on WCW's own show without anybody in charge knowing what he was going to say, but also slandering Hulk Hogan like Vince Russo is now important enough. Hogan made, as they said, um, into seven figures off of Russo cutting that promo in the settlement with TBS. And he again pissed off everybody. The fans are going, what the fuck is this fucking guy out there again for doing this shit? And the wrestlers are like, look at this insufferable cunt putting him fucking self on television again. And then Russo said, every promo I've ever cut, I don't know what I'm going to say. That material writes itself. He said, in the moment, that's real. Here's where the story is. Here's where my character is. Go. Jesus Christ, he thinks he's De Niro. Again, I ask you, when did anybody even say, 
Wow, that was a pretty good wrestling promo from this fucking clown. No, I mean, the one they showed with him going after Hogan after Hogan left the building, he definitely seemed like into it and passionate. Yes. Eddie and shit and goddamn and that son of yeah. a bitch. And that's the one that cost him and, a few million dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, but just, and he goes out and he uses, and that's before you used profanity, especially all that profanity in the same promo, even on pay-per-view. And he goes out and he does that. It certainly got attention. I don't know if anybody's ever said it was good. It certainly... It got attention, but then he did it to make himself a big deal and put himself on par with Hulk Hogan in front of fans who were asking, what the fuck? And at that point, Hogan said, well, I'm going to sue. And of course, he, he they said, oh, well, Russo made a big deal. The judge threw it out, and the second judge wouldn't take the appeal, blah, blah, blah. Hogan didn't think he was going to get money for slander from Vince Russo. He sued for slander and breach of contract because he knew that TBS, they'd had a history since they bought the company. They would settle lawsuits for discrimination. They would settle lawsuits for wrongful termination. They would settle lawsuits for whatever the fuck because they just didn't want to fucking take a chance on paying a judgment. So they would give everybody money, and he got it. Millions of dollars. And here's another thing. Do you think, Brian, there were executives and forces within TBS that wanted to get rid of the wrestling company even when it was profitable, correct? Always, yes. Do you think that now that it was losing money at a fucking record pace, $60 million in the year 2000, do you think that anybody also said in a closed-door meeting, and fuck, now Hogan's suing us, we're going to have to pay him millions, can't we dump this fucking company? That's the thing, and everyone always points fingers at everyone else about who killed WCW. It wasn't me, it was the executives. Listen. If all of a sudden Vince Russo went in there and the ratings went up and they started making money hand over fist, WCW would have still been in business. The exact opposite happened. And as a lot of different people, they get blamed for it. But again, it wouldn't have gotten to that point if the ratings hadn't gone down and if they had found a way to make it somewhat profitable, they blew it. They blew the opportunity they had. Under Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff, they gave them more than enough money losses, lawsuits, and trouble in general to give the executives in Turner Broadcasting that wanted ammunition against the wrestling company all they needed. And that was what happened. But anyway, so Russo cusses like he's got Tourette's and announces the new main event that night is Jeff Jarrett versus Booker T., for the real WCW title, because Hogan's not the champion or whatever the fuck. And Lance Storm is like, they're, they're all sitting watching the monitor. Is this the plan? What the hell is going on here? And Russo said he'd had it up to here with the wrestling shit. So Booker beat Jeff, and Russo thought, because he said that that was the real title and Hogan's was fake, that the fans would just buy it. And he really believed that it, it, Russo said it was working a thousand percent. And all I'm reading is Vince Russo finally put Hulk Hogan in his place. Did you love that little exchange? Well, it showed you what his audience, what audience he was looking to, I guess I should say, for support. That's exactly what he would read the five people that said, good for Vince Russo for putting Hulk Hogan, and think that that was goddamn a genius piece of business that people have been clamoring for. He is a hero in his own mind. So Russo says everything that happened was the way it was laid out. Bischoff calls bullshit. Nobody knew about the promo. Russo calls double bullshit. Bischoff says that's where the pathological part and pathological liar comes from. Hogan gets on Bubba's show and calls Russo a jack-off and a very stupid, stupid man. 
And and Russo says the judge didn't buy the the libel part because it was a wrestling angle. And since Russo thought that Hulk Hogan and Vince Russo are characters, bro. And that's a, that's another insight. He always thought wrestlers were actors in tights. And that's why the guys that knew better hated him and the modern kids fell for it because they thought they were going to be movie stars. And Bischoff points out that if Russo was a character and took unprofessional liberties with another performer, then that wouldn't make it okay. But he has a problem with reality. So this, again, this is the greatest heel program. And then Uncle Dave chimes in with, I quote, I'm trying to discuss what two dishonest people say about something from 20 years ago. And then... And then Bischoff goes after Dave. Yes. And he's... And so... Calls him a useful idiot. He's a useful idiot. Triple A or Triple H. Um, fucking Hulk Hogan. I, I abbreviated Hulk Hogan settles with Turner for the fucking money. And Jeff Jarrett summed up Hulk Hogan, a business that gave him everything. That's what he gave back. The most self-centered, egotistical power play that only benefited Hulk. Vince McMahon mm. buys WCW out from under Bischoff. He's just mad Hogan didn't want to lose to him. Well, it would have been nice if he'd got it on the resume. Yeah, the same way Austin didn't want to lose to him. <laughs> well, I've... hey, Jerry Jarrett paid Hulk, <laughs> uh, you know, at least more than he paid Austin. Anyway, um, did you hear when, when they talked about Turner Broadcasting, Bischoff was really going to buy, allegedly, and we were hearing about it, going to buy the company for tens of millions of dollars with this, you know, firm that he had found to put up some money. But Turner executives canceled the TV shows, the time slots. They can buy, you can buy WCW, but we're not going to carry wrestling on the air, which made the company worthless. So they dumped it to, Vince for $4 million, and Dave said that was equal to buying Manhattan for $25. It was $24. It was $24, Dave. For heaven's sake, you ought to be... I hope he does a retraction on that or a correction. We'll see. I... <laughs> well, think of... Put in the inflation calculator. When was the purchase of Manhattan Island? What was that? Sixteen. 70 something maybe put in the inflation calculator $24 to uh present day and see how much that that's a lot of money yeah hold on the first one doesn't go back past 1913 oh well no it, it, 24 yeah, this, this one was, doesn't go to past 1914 inflation no. calculator what year 16 16 let's say 1675 just to be a rough because 1913 $25 wouldn't even have got you the Bronx Okay, so what are you asking for in 1675 money? $24. $24 in 1675 is worth $2,034.06 today. Well, now that seems a little low. It does. It seems like that ought to be worth at least $27, $30 million. <laughs> that seems a bit high. All right, well, anyway, uh, the closing statement on this program was from Vince Russo. His closing words, do you know how little this shit matters? It's a form of entertainment. And then my DVR at that point committed suicide. It just froze up. It said, I don't want you to even hear any more of this. I care too much about you, Jim. I think anybody, if you watch this show, you may not know any more about Bash at the Beach, or you may not know who to believe, but you will understand now why I would willingly chainsaw this motherfucker's head off if we were alone in the woods together. I think everybody has now figured that out, haven't they? He seems somewhat unbearable, especially if you care about professional wrestling. Again, he seems to have a lot of grievances because he doesn't have a job in wrestling, and then tells you that he hates wrestling, hates the people in wrestling... He's too good for wrestling. And has refused to do anything else for the last 20 years. In his eyes, I guess he was just really good at it for a few years, 25 years ago. I don't know, but 
Dark Side of the Ring. Hell, a lot of people could say that about sex. An interesting season of Dark Side of the Ring. What is that? One more episode, right? Marty Jannetty? Marty Jannetty. They're going out with a bang. Well, Jim, after Dark Side of the Ring this week, it may be difficult to watch that episode for anyone who hasn't seen it yet to have to hear all that. But maybe if you just want to get the information, you can watch it with closed captioning on and listen to something else with your Raycons. Well, that, you know, that's true because taking away the one of the senses would make this the people on this program more palatable. If you couldn't see the ugliness of Uncle Dave or the treachery of Russo or the smarminess of Bischoff, if you couldn't see him or if you couldn't hear him, if you were looking at him but you couldn't hear him, maybe that would be even better because the voices yeah. are so grating. That's what I was saying. Yeah, well, I'm just saying I'm mulling it over in my head, see? I'm just saying in one way or another, <laughs> just either don't look at him or don't listen to him. I didn't say anything about taking away the listener's sight. I said, let's well, divert the hearing somewhere else. Some people may have wanted to gouge their eyeballs out of their head while this program was on, and, and you can't deny those people their opportunity, but it'd probably be less painful if you just stuck something in your ears. I'm not even talking about a screwdriver or a railroad spike. I'm talking about the everyday wireless earbuds from Raycon, because everybody knows they don't have any wires. We established that on the last commercial we did for them. That way you don't walk around looking like a fucking Martian or a robot or somebody with wires hanging out of your ears. Well, that many, just make you look like an idiot. Well, no, many people have had wired earbuds and probably yeah, still do, well, but Raycon's like a step up. That's right. You need to step up or else why are you going to get knocked out? Because, you know, that's it. When somebody, you know, somebody's walking down the street, they got to... What's the matter with you? Oh, I'm trying to step up. I'm sorry. Step up or get knocked out. If you're walking down the street with those strings hanging out of your head, you look like an idiot, and somebody ought to come up and snatch those strings and punch you right in the face. What you need to do is you need to surreptitiously stick these wireless earbuds in your ears. Nobody's even going to know that they're there. And then you can be bopping out to some Led Zeppelin or maybe some Skinnerd, and somebody can come up to you on the street and say something to you, and you don't, you don't say anything. You don't even acknowledge they're there because you're listening to your own soundtrack in your head. And they'll say something else, and you'll ignore them, and then they'll punch you in the fucking face for being rude and ignoring them. Well, no. But at least you'll be hearing good quality music and you'll be happy right up until the moment of impact. And don't forget, actually, let's take that back. You do not have to worry about getting punched in the face because there's awareness mode, so you'll be aware of who's around you. And of course, you may be enjoying the wonderful tunes or sounds that you get on your Raycon earbuds, but you'll be aware well, enough to prevent no, strangers from punching you in the face. Not unless you're a, you've used the earbud tap function to toggle onto the awareness mode. If you're not aware enough to become aware and know you need to be aware, then you'll be unaware. Well, that's why and we're letting boom, everyone know. Just happened. That's why we're letting everyone know. This is like a public service announcement for all Raycon users. Well, we can't wet nurse these people and just lead them through it by the fucking ear. You're going to have to toggle your own awareness mode if you want to avoid getting punched in the face if you wear Raycon wireless earbuds. No. But you should wear them. Hyperbolically, metaphorically, you do not have to worry about the risk of being punched in the face just because you're wearing the wonderful Raycon earbuds. But only if you ignore people because you don't toggle the awareness mode. It could just See, be because just you're rude. just make sure you're aware. It could, if you're ignoring people, it could just be you're rude. It has nothing to do with Raycon. Sometimes they sneak up on you. The rude people? Yes. So you need to fucking be aware. And I'll tell you right now, also, you can stay calm with these things. You put in like some, some of the, the nice white noise or you put in the classical music and you meditate. Or if you want to exercise, you put in the upbeat music to pump you up, and then you can go out there and, and pump the iron. And, or you can put in the rock and roll, and, and if you go out in a field and you find some of those mushrooms that grow in the middle of cow pies and chew a bunch of them, you'll hear colors, and you'll, see all, you'll take a vacation in your head. Because well, the summertime is here, it's vacation time. That's what they're saying on this copy. And you need to get in a vacation that's, state of mind. Whoa, whoa. So well, let's just you specify. You put in the wireless earbuds, that's, you listen to some rock and roll music, and eat some mushrooms growing nope, in cow that's shit. that's not in the copy. That's and not in the copy. And you take your own vacation. You don't have to go anywhere. Raycon is for responsible adults. And responsible and, adults and can so do their thing. And so are covered mushrooms. Well, hold on now. There's nothing 
Raycon does not endorse mushrooms. Raycon has nothing to do with mushrooms other than you may potentially ingest them and have the Raycon earbuds in your ear, but they're two separate things. And that's totally up to you. It's not their responsibility. That's right. It's not in the copy either. Let's just specify that. They did not write any of that. None of this is in the copy, but they do have a 32-hour battery life, eight hours of playtime. I get you can even, can you plug other small household appliances into these earbuds and power them as well? Uh, I don't believe so. No. But you don't have to worry about power outages because they got batteries. So if you get hit by lightning and your electricity goes out, these things, the battery power will come right up and your corpse will still be playing good quality music or wonderful podcasts when they find you and scoop you up. There is no guarantee that these will continue working after the user is hit by lightning if the earbuds are in the user's ear. But do you think that anybody's going to care at that point? They're going to say, well, we lost fucking Frank, but goddamn, I'm going to get a refund on those Raycons. Well, I'm pretty sure the family would care about the electrocuted dead family member well yeah but you're talking about you know not being able to guarantee that these things will withstand a direct hit by lightning if they're in your ears i would think if that happens you got other things to worry about than fucking bothering the raycon people about goddamn getting a refund well speaking of other things to worry about i don't know why we're worrying about any of this we should be worrying about the wonderful music and of course podcasts all sorts of things you can listen to with raycon earbuds in your ears they're worth it they're great very yeah. popular here in the house you can make phone calls and listen to them on these things also, from what I understand. That's right. Ken, what happens if, if, you, uh, if your phone is out of order? Your like mine was. Order. If your phone is out of order like mine was a few weeks ago, then do you, do you get the, the same tone that I got when I tried to get a dial tone? Do you get the... Oh, I don't know if Raycon's connecting with landlines. I believe it would be through Bluetooth connection with most cellular telephones. Well, even at, whether you have blue teeth, folks, or whether you have... Green teeth, brown teeth, or dentures, it doesn't matter. The everyday earbuds will figure out a way to play you some wonderful music or distracting podcasts or motivational audio of any kind. And right now, they start at half the price of other premium audio brands, and you can even save more money. Because if you go right now to buy Raycon, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E, you're going to get 15% off their already incredibly low prices. Anything you want at buyraycon.com. Besides, of course, the technical crew, they stay there. But anything for sale on the site, 15% off if you go to buyraycon.com slash JCE. And that's just for you guys, because me and Brian want to make sure that you hear fine music up until either you get punched in the face or struck by lightning. Raycon.